<laughs> well, everybody, uh, I just want to welcome you all again. First of all, uh, my name is Nick Koziel, and I work in the Center of Excellence in Data Science. I am the manager of business engagement and communications there. Uh, I want to give a uh, hearty thank you to our students and the ARVR speakers. They did a wonderful job. And the lightning round of the, uh, um, the end of their presentation is kind of a good segue into what we're going to be doing here today. So big round of applause again for the students. Thank you so much. So I don't know if this is by design or not, but I am placed in a very dangerous position, and that is between you and lunch. Um, so thanks, Mishnat, uh, and the rest of the planning committee for, for putting me there. Um, so just a few expectations and kind of rules about what we're doing. This is the first time we've done this, so we're going to be kind of going through this uh, and learning as we go, and we, we want suggestions on how to improve this in the future. But essentially, it's pretty simple. We're going to be having our businesses come up in the order of your technology showcase brochure, uh, we have a few additions at the end that uh, we have added, and uh, one omission, and I apologize again to Ron Hunt and Green Tornado. Uh, he got all his stuff in, and, and, I, and we missed the, the, missed the ball on that one somehow. Um, but first, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about partnering. The whole idea behind this networking and mentoring, not mentoring, networking event is the partnership programs and finding partners for researchers and businesses, which is what our two organizations, CEIS, the Center for Emerging uh, Innovations and Sciences, and the CUE do. Um, so as you're up here as a business, as you're up here as faculty, I want you to keep in mind the opportunities for funding and the opportunities to partner with some of these organizations, businesses, and faculty. So really quickly, I'm just going to go over some of the funding programs for our two centers. Uh, there, for CEIS funding programs and industry university coll collaboration, we have the Collaborative Innovation Research. Uh, it supports one year of research, can be with any New York State company. Uh, usually faculty are at U of R or RIT. Um, these things are often extended for two or more years. And there's a two to one match re requirement. So companies and state funding have, have to come in and match together. Uh, reduced overhead for further increases and funding available for research. Uh, amount varies, but one grad student per year is about 90,000 total. Uh, and it's usually initiated by faculty, but this EIS can help uh, with match funding, so we can help you find um, some matching funding. Um, and then we also have the short-term applied research or STAR grant. It's aimed at uh, more applied problems, more developed problems, one, uh, usually one semester or less, and aimed at small companies. It only requires a one-to-one -one match, uh, but it can be waived. So it just depends on the type of project and what's going on there. Uh, it's often initiated by the small company looking to work with faculty on specific expertise. So some of the things that you just heard about and being discussed could possibly be some of those things, and it's up to $10,000. Um, the Center of Excellence, uh, our partnership programs are actually found in your, your folders. So we have three main ones right now. Uh, we're working on developing some others, but one um, I know a number of the businesses that we're working with are actually engaged in some of these partnerships and CEIS's partnerships already. But to kind of keep in mind these opportunities in data science and uh, for the Capstone Partnership, it's a course that happens in the fall and spring. And we can work with any company in the world that is willing to put forth a data challenge or a problem that a group of students, both undergrad and graduate, will tackle as a group in their capstone course. Uh, the requirement basically is that the, the, the excuse me, the um, company will provide the data, the problem set, and some resources as far as people to guide them through the problem statement. So more information is in your packet on that. We also have the Data Science Research Collaboration Program, which is a grant between um, a business and a faculty member researcher anywhere in New York State. So the business has to be in New York State, and so does the faculty member. Um, it's a very unique program. A lot of the centers at different universities don't tech tend to work directly with um, other universities, but I think it's a really cool program. We give to about $60,000, um, and essentially the, the challenge is finding that connection between the company 
and the researcher. So that's kind of where I come in. So I'm looking at what these pitchers are doing and I'll be following up with all of you to try to figure out, are there industries that will work with re these researchers? Are there researchers that will work with these industries? Um, so more information again is in your packet about that. And then there's the data science internship program, which happens in the summer. These are U of R students that we will post a position for a small company of 100 employees or less in New York State. And what we do is we work with the companies to uh, first to kind of develop what that position is. And then we will post that position on our internal job board handshake where students all across the University of Rochester can apply. And we will then um, help through the process to identify who the final candidate is, and the center will pay for two months of an experience for that intern at your company. Um, so those are that's a little bit about the about the centers. Um, I urge all of you to connect with me, um, and we can talk a little bit more. Um, the great thing about going into lunch after this is that when we're done with all the pitches, we're able to kind of continue with that networking into the lunchtime. So, uh, so we're going in order of the. Booklet, and the first person up is from the U of R in audio information research. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Nick, for reminding the rules. I'll be quick. So my name is Jiao Duan, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Rochester. And I direct the audio information research lab, or the air lab. In the lab, we work on four main areas of research. The first area is music information retrieval, where we analyze music signals. You know, I love music. Last month, I was performing at the Hockstein Gala event in the other building of Memorial Art Gallery. And uh, um, we work on music transcription, tr like transcribing music audio into music notation. We work on music source separation, separating multiple instrument signals from the mixture. In recent years, we also work on music generation, using AI to generate music or impaint music um, that human has composed. And we also develop human AI collaborative music making systems. Uh, we have a system that allows a human musician to play duet counterpoint improvisation with an AI agent in real time. Um, another area of research is speech processing. We work on speaker verification and anti-spoofing technology. We try to detect whether the speech is synthesized or is authentic from human beings. We also work on the other side of this technology, which is voice conversion and text-to-speech generation. You know, we work on both sides, so we know the insights of, of both. Um, and we also work on speaker diarization, understanding who was talking when during a conversation with multiple people. Um, and uh, uh, we work on speech emotion analysis and expressive speech generation. The third area of research we work on is environmental sound understanding. We work on sound retrieval using vocal imitation as queries instead of using text queries. Uh, we work on sound event generation uh, and uh, a general scene understanding, uh, detecting the sound events in some continuous audio. Um, and we also work on spatial, spatial audio rendering, predicting heterality transfer functions based on human uh, uh, body shapes. Um, the last area is audiovisual processing. We have been working on audiovisual processing, understanding of human uh, music performances and uh, um, speech uh, signals. Uh, uh, we can use audiovisual information to help speech separation in noisy environments. And I hope this demo works. Let me, so my student asked me to rap. <laughs> okay, there's no audio. But, so the idea is that we can drive a static picture of a human face and uh, using some noisy speech audio. Got a progress, got to move, you got to work so we can get you to the front. Okay, so something like that. <laughs> this is a old technology a few years ago, and we are still developing some new technology to make it more natural. Um, yeah, so that's that. And regarding commercial collaboration, I have been uh, collaborating with Ingenity, which is a Rochester-based um, uh, bi biometrics, biometrics identification company, and for the past few years, and our work has been supported by the COE uh, grants. So I really enjoy working with business and the collaboration with other researchers. If you're interested in talking to me about research, collaboration, uh, tech transfer, commercialization, or want to understand my experience with COE grants, talk to me. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Lenz Lesniak, and I'm here uh, representing Clario Vision. So let's do a little optics. So in general, there's two ways to bend light or refract light. You can either do it with a lens, 
So your spectacles, your prescription of your glasses is determined by the curvature and thickness of your spectacles, or you can vary the what's called refractive index of the material. So instead of changing the surface of glasses, what we do is a kind of optical alchemy. We use ultra-fast lasers and we focus them into materials like soft contact lenses, the intraocular lenses that are implanted inside your eye during cataract surgery, or directly into the cornea, the front surface of your eyeball, and we modify the refractive index with the laser. Uh, this technology was invented by uh, Professor Wayne Knox, who's right over here in the front row, and there's a few of his graduate students in the audience. And um, yeah, as you can see, there's a, a lot of good vision applications. So our aim is to correct vision, human vision. There's a lot of interesting things you can do with diffractive optical wavefronts that are only enabled by putting these diffractive optics inside a material, inside a contact lens or inside the prosthetic intraocular lens. So these laser inscribed patterns are not surface features, they're really in the lens, kind of like the cream in an Oreo cookie. So um, a couple of the big problems that we're tackling are presbyopia correction. So after the age of 50, if you live long enough, every, no, everybody is no longer able to accommodate. We've heard about accommodation a couple times already today. So you can no longer see both far and close up. That's the need for reading glasses. So we can bring um, the learnings from cataract surgery into contact lenses with diffractive multifocal contact lenses. We're also working on, not just for folks over the age of 50, but folks under the age of 20 with something called myopia progression. Um, the World Health Organization estimates that by the year 2050, half of the planet will be myopic. This is an epidemic all over the world, especially in developed countries, especially in East Asia, where nine out of 10 high school graduates in China are myopic. This is a public health concern because as the eye becomes myopic and axially elongates, the very sensitive tissue called the retina in the back of the eye is more, uh, prone to having permanently blinding diseases like retinal detachment, myopic maculopathy. So we're designing diffractive uh, contact lenses as a therapy to slow down the rate of eye growth in children to combat myopia progression. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. If you guys want to chat more during lunch, I'd be happy to. So thank you. Hi, I'm Molly Zimmerman. I'm from the New York State Science and Technology Law Center which is located at Syracuse University's College of Law Innovation Law Center. Um, we're a NYSTAR sponsored resource and um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to tell you a little bit about it. Um, the Innovation Law Center is an experiential learning program where law and business students work with new technologies from research centers all around New York State to um, provide research to early stage companies. The research is in um, prior art, the uh, secondary market research, and regulatory research. Prior art research, as many of you may know, but many early stage companies don't, um, includes patents, patent applications, uh, academic publications, and products that are available um, anywhere in the world and are relevant to whether something whether a new technology uh, qualifies for uh, patent protection. So um, prior art research is one of the biggest areas of research we complete. And this is very important to any of you developing new technology with an eye towards commercializing it uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, while you're developing it, it's really important to be aware of what patents and products are already out there. Uh, you can actually design around them sometimes and maximize your chances of getting a broad patent, which is a, a better patent, a more, uh, gives you more of a commercial advantage, and minimizing the chances that you will infringe on existing patents that already exist. Um, the second reason is to, um, when it is ready to apply for patent protection, to um, obtain or to assess whether it makes sense for you to make that investment in obtaining a patent. Almost any patent attorney will be able to get you some kind of a patent, but often it's so narrow as to not really be worth 
the investment that takes. Um, and by understanding that and understanding the reading of claims, you'll be in a much better position to make that assessment. There's sometimes a reason to seek a, a very narrow patent, but you should be cognizant of why you're doing what. Um, I just want to clarify that our research center is not a substitute for patent attorneys or any other law firms. What we provide is research that's helpful in making those decisions. The other reason um, prior art research is important is to understand what active patents are in the space where you'll be practicing, where you're thinking of marketing your product. Many times people don't realize that you could have a patent and still infringe on other patents. And the final reason is because investors want to know. They want to know that you know what the patent landscape is, what the uh, prior art is, and they want to know who, that you know what the competitors in this space are doing and how you're different from them and moving forward. So we have a table, we have some guidebooks, and I look forward to talking with any of you. The nice thing about NYSTAR sponsorship is that we can provide much of this research um, without a cost, um, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rama Das. I'm the director of the U of R Medicine Motion Labs. I'm also assistant professor at the uh, Department of Orthopedic and uh, also Department of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, I'm here today to present you a great opportunity. So currently, uh, the way clinicians assess disability in function of patients is based on surveys. Uh, surveys, uh, they're very powerful. They give an opportunity for the, for the patients to actually um, uh, demonstrate how they feel. However, they're very subjective because my five out of 10 pain score is different than your five out of 10 pain scores, right? Therefore, we need more objective uh, outcome or measurements. Uh, this is why we're going to open this summer uh, U of R Medicine Motion Labs. We're actually opening five motion labs that we are, that are going to be able, that are going to allow us to assess the stability of functions of patients uh, before and after surgical or uh, physical therapy intervention. Uh, we have uh, five labs over there, but three of them actually have some uh, uh, external reality adds on uh, to it. Uh, part of our equipment, including uh, motion, uh, human motion captures, marker and marker slash system. I don't know if you saw how they're making those video games, but the patients can just walk in the room and we can make a skeleton and tell you exactly how much range of motion uh, the patient is doing. We do have some surface and, and fine wire EMG system to capture uh, um, patients' muscular activity. We do have a couple of EEG helmets to capture brain activity along a bunch of force plates uh, and oxygen consumption mask. Uh, the problem is that we're putting all these sensors all in patients and then we tell them, okay, now try to go freely <laughs> and, and pretend you're like, like you're at your own home, uh, which is kind of a struggle. Um, what I did actually, three of our labs have uh, extended reality adds on to it, basically, when we're actually projecting to the patient's uh, simulation, if it's on treadmill or they're standing or we're just putting the VR uh, goggles on it. Uh, so what we're looking, we're looking to, uh, to partner with somebody who can help us to build an environment, like a natural environment, that'll be able to feed in from our sensors uh, and trigger based on what the patient is doing. For instance, if a patient is going to a 90 degrees of shoulder uh, abduction, we allow to advance the animation to the next level and help the physician, uh, the clinician, the physical therapy uh, to get a better and more specific uh, treatment plan for the patients. Uh, that's about it. If you're interested in having any ideas, uh, we have a bunch of toys. I'll be happy to speak with you over lunch. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Seva Visviswaran. I'm with uh, Monroe Community College, part of uh, their Workforce Economic and Workforce Development Center. Um, one of the projects I'm leading right now uh, is uh, what we call career exploration. It's a very strategic objective for Monroe Community College and I'm sure other uh, community colleges around the nation because um, we have this huge gap, right? We have this huge supply-demand gap where we have hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of jobs that are out there, high-paying jobs requiring high skills in industries like manufacturing, construction, um, uh, new, new uh, you know, energy technologies and so on. 
and yet there is uh, not that much student interest, right? So we're really trying to see how to generate uh, student interest right from very early on, from K-12 onwards, and especially in middle school, high school, and trying to get them uh, interested uh, in all these uh, industries and career options that uh, they provide. So we are approaching uh, it uh, using this sort of uh, three-stage model where uh, we're trying to get them interested initially by making it more fun. So I think this is where we're leveraging AR, VR technologies uh, because, uh, again, uh, uh, younger students, kids are much more uh, engaged. They're enthusiastic to try out new things when uh, it's exposed to them through these technologies. Um, uh, so that's where they start. But once you kind of uh, capture their interest, we want them to go a little bit deeper, now expose them to more industrial uh, grade simulations. They're still simulations. Uh, they're still uh, artificial environment, so to speak, safe. Uh, but they can get a little bit better understanding of uh, what those uh, industry career paths entail. And once uh, they go graduate from there, then is really when we want them to go through industry certifications, uh, academic programs, advanced degrees, and so on and so forth. So that's uh, really the model. And in order to um, realize that model, uh, we're really looking at uh, you know, building awareness from multiple dimensions. And from the technologies that we have so far deployed, uh, uh, you know, uh, Oculus headset space technologies, and even uh, some of the industry grade uh, simulators like the RDS, I think the occupational awareness is well addressed. So if people are getting much uh, better idea of what these uh, uh, occupations are, what the skill sets are. Um, but I think the gaps where uh, we are seeing is sort of building the self-awareness. Uh, those are not very well incorporated yet into these experiences. And self-awareness is very important, if, uh, especially in the context of career exploration, because it's not about just uh, driving interest. It's also getting people to understand where their strengths are, what you're good at. And a lot of times when you work with what you're good at, you start to love it, you get better, and you do great things. And uh, that's what uh, a lot of us here who have been in these industries know. Um, so building self-awareness and, again, decision-making that came uh, a lot in a lot of the examples and case studies that were shared today. Uh, again, it's, uh, a lot of decision-making capabilities are in these tools today, uh, but a lot more um, uh, could be added, especially when it comes to you know, ethical uh, bias and so on and so forth. So that's an area we feel uh, there's some uh, things that to be addressed. But the most important one, most interesting one, and one area that I'm really uh, looking for collaborations is civic engagement, because we believe that's really should be uh, at the heart, uh, if not uh, front and center of career exploration. Because it's not about just uh, gaining technical skills or awareness about industry. It's really being able to connect culturally, uh, uh, you know, uh, locally, regionally, and uh, historically what these technologies mean. So if you are from Rochester, we believe you should understand you know, uh, what, is, what is Kodak, what did Kodak do, what technologies did they produce. Kodak may not be there today in its old form, but may, much of the material science that Kodak produced is uh, in all the companies in pharma today in and around uh, this area. Same thing with Xerox and Bosch and Lam and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of um, civic engagement, historical cultural context that we believe has to be brought in um, into this whole career exploration space. So um, um, I'm looking for uh, partners, collaborators. Again, we are a community college. Uh, we have a lot of problem statements, uh, and we have access to a lot of the demography and uh, the target population that some of you researchers uh, will be interested to work with to test your ideas and your models. So uh, I'll be very, very happy to collaborate with you. Uh, my contacts is in that brochure. Unfortunately, I put it up here, but please feel to reach out to me, and thank you for the opportunity. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Vaslaviak, and I'm the Senior Manager of Operational Performance at Avangrid. Avangrid is the parent company of four major utilities uh, in electricity in, in the Northeast, uh, United Illuminating in Connecticut, Central Maine Power, New York State Electric and Gas, and Rochester Gas and Electric. And so kind of what we do in the operational performance organization is really develop data science models and methodology uh, to really understand and improve grid reliability 
and resiliency, right? The, the work we do is very much a, a, a critical need uh, for the people here. And so we do a lot of, say, development of machine learning models on the Rochester underground in order to understand how best can we invest to improve, again, the reliability of, of the city of Rochester, as well as leveraging emerging technologies such as computer vision to better understand the health of our assets and uh, also say, uh, you know, our vegetation risk and exposure. We've got a pilot going on in Ithaca. And really just again, how do we leverage all of the data we have as electric utility in order to, to best improve the customer experience? And so one of the uh, opportunities we really see um, in collaboration with the University of Rochester is really, you know, not only developing a talent pipeline, you know, we're very proud that our data science analytics uh, department is primarily made up of University of Rochester and RIT grads. It is located here in Rochester, um, but also collaborating with the university on understanding how can we develop, you know, the grid of the future here in New York. And so um, a lot of really, really exciting and, and relatively cutting edge work for an electric utility. And um, we look forward to more opportunities here in the city of Rochester. So thank you. I'm Sam Samantha at Finger Lakes Community College. I had a background in nanoscience for a decade before I started teaching there about three decades ago. The problem of workforce is uh, something many of you realize, and I'm talking about technician level workforce. When it comes to uh, employees with bachelor's, master's, doctorate, you can hire them from anywhere. When it comes to technician workforce, it has to be locally homegrown. 98% of the businesses in this country are small and medium-sized enterprises, less than 500 employees, whereas Companies with more than 500 employees, they are able to hire a bunch of people with different degrees, put together a team, solve problems. When you're looking at a small, medium-sized business or even a small team in a business of, say, 300, they have budget to hire just one more person for that team, and that person has to be very versatile. Often, they have job description but they cannot find the right person. So they are looking for a unicorn. And the way to create that unicorn for the company basically has to involve uh, businesses, has to work with community colleges and other uh, education providers, and they have to work together because education system cannot really have degree program and training to train for all these diverse needs that the businesses have. They don't all want the same thing. By the way, the SMEs employ half of the national workforce. Although they're 98% of the businesses, they employ half of the national workforce. And so the solution, again, there are um, many innovative approaches, like Siva just uh, described from MCC and elsewhere. What we have done is we require our students to have a 270 hours minimum uh, duration co-op with local business. That's a requirement, not just recommendation. So we go out, meet with businesses. We have a relationship with about 50 high-tech businesses across, I would say, all industries in the region. And we match our individual student to the need that we understand is present at the business. So we have been doing that for 10 years, um, over 10 years, and we have one of the highest completion rate among technical program in the country. Some of you may not know this because at university level, you don't often see this problem. At community college level, the completion rate of program, completion rate of student is less than 25% for three years our completion rate is 75% for two years. And I believe part of the reason is the co-op. Once the student starts working, they see the relevance of what they are doing. They see the light at the end of the tunnel before, long before the end of the tunnel, they persist. 
we have high flex scheduling, so students are able to uh, we, uh, recommend that they come in the class in person, but they can also connect or WebEx in real time or learn asynchronously. We have a grant from Smart Manufacturing Institute, SESME. It is one of the 16 Manufacturing USA institutes to develop learning modules for our students as well as incumbent workers. Another interesting thing that we found out that every year one of the four or five graduates is actually a person who had a prior baccalaureate in non-technical area, say in liberal arts. So I believe there are a lot of underemployed liberal arts graduate uh, with good work history in this country. They are basically hidden resource for high technology workforce. They are proven students, so they pick up skills very quickly, and many of those skills, teamwork, communication, are highly prized anyways. We have an event on May 16th, public event, and I can share a flyer about that. Uh, part of the panel discussion for the event is liberal arts of high technologies. So I'm uh, looking for collaborations, both from university uh, members as well as businesses to help develop digital twin, augmented virtual reality, and industrial AI training for our students and other incumbent workers in the local businesses. Workforce critical for reshoring semiconductor manufacturing and other supply chain, we know that this is important for New York State, can be readily developed, but they, one way to develop that across this region as well as country is to require that this program have a co-op coupled with adaptable uh, skills in automation and industry 4.0. Um, I'm here for the rest of the day, at least till three o'clock, so please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And so my name is Jim Poor, and I'm the co-founder of a company here in Rochester called Immersatech. And our focus over the last five years has been in developing audio technologies to essentially make human communication in virtual spaces significantly better than it is today. And so been the the very fortunate uh, beneficiary of a number of students out of the U of R uh, graduate uh, electrical engineering program, Dr. Baco and Duan and others here today. Just very pleased to, to highlight kind of as a success that the benefits that, that much of the work that's being done in the university and really among many of the people that, that we saw this morning, um, I kind of reference to Anton's presentation this morning about kind of creating realistic audio uh, engagement in virtual spaces is kind of a premise of why we started the company. My background was in a number of years in global telecom companies. And frankly, for many of us that, that have lived through the pandemic and sitting on Zoom calls for endless hours a day, your experience is a feeling like you're in the, the room with the other participants was probably far less than stellar. And so that's exactly what Immersive Tech was kind of founded to, to try and solve. And so in immersive spaces, the ability to have large communication systems kind of reenact and create those virtual experiences is certainly been problematic. And we've been over the last several years been building tools that are in the form of SDKs and other kind of processing elements for developers to bring more immersive technology to kind of standard communications. Like today, majority of big global communication systems are mono, very one channel, kind of bland, not very exciting. And so over the last few years, we've commercialized a number of patents that Immersatech holds in creating spatial audio technology for communications to make it so that you start hearing people in virtual space from the kind of natural areas of where you would expect to hear them versus all crumpled up on top of each other and, and not being able to frankly understand who may be speaking 
understanding secondarily kind of what they're saying, because in a lot of cases in virtual experiences, you have dogs in the background, you have all kinds of uh, inherent noises that come into to the communication channel that frankly you don't want there. And so we felt very early on the ability to create a truly immersive experience was being able to, to remove all the things that would make you think that you're not in that virtual experience or in that immersive experience. And so, um, to just kind of boil it down, the key areas that we've been working on over the last several years have been in the areas of noise removal. And so we've done a tremendous amount of work and very pleased with, again, some of the students that, that we've taken out of the, the U of R program have built really a very exciting, fundamentally new and interesting noise removal machine learning platform. And so tremendous amount of uh, work done there. And that's where I think from a collaboration perspective with the universities and, and other partners in this ecosystem, there's really an unbelievable amount of additional problems to be solved, especially in the area of voice clarity and voice enhancement for communications, as well as really any type of, of kind of virtualized experience that, that involves human to human communication. And then finally, the spatial element of it. And so um, that's an area where we originally started, but to get there, we felt all these other things would have to take place to make those experiences much better. And so I would just highlight, we have some new and exciting demos that, that we put up on our website that I'd welcome any of you that, that have an interest in kind of listening to how noise removal and certain areas, I think we're very early days in our voice clarity work. And so look for additional advancements there in the next coming years. And frankly, the spatial audio component, many platforms now in the, the global communication space are starting to, to pick up that this is going to have to be the way it's done and providing stereo audio on their platforms among other things, which is going to make really, I think, virtualized experiences much better than they are today. And so be around for, for lunch and later today and look forward to, to collaborating with you on opportunities to, to see what's possible here. So thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Gonzalo Mateos. I'm with the faculty of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at the University of Rochester. Uh, since very recently, I'm also serving as uh, Associate Director for uh, Research at U of R's Gergen Institute for Data Science. Now, in terms of my background and, and training, that's been electrical engineering all along, specifically in, in signal processing. Now, in terms of my, my research, the overarching theme of my program is on uh, algorithms, analysis, and applications of uh, statistical signal processing tools to uh, study networks, namely often large, uh, complex uh, systems of uh, interconnected components. Now, I lead a, a highly collaborative research group uh, that develops methodology to uh, study relational or learn from relational data, uh, which we often find useful to encode or work with, uh, with graphs, right, that have uh, nodes, vertices, and their connections or edges. You can think of it, for example, as the regions of interest uh, in the brain and maybe functional connections among these regions that we estimate from neuroimaging data. Or if you want to think about uh, multi-agent physical systems where you have a bunch of uh, sensors, uh, IoT devices, uh, drones or wireless transceivers, which then might be connected, for example, through uh, wireless links. Right? So then all of those are examples of, of networks that we study. Now, uh, let me just use uh, one minute to give a high-level overview of some of our current uh, research projects uh, that I find exciting. And of course, I'll be happy to discuss them more uh, deeply if you're interested of offline, of course. So we work, uh, and you can see, as you can see there in, in the upper left as an example, we work in a wide sense of a, a broad uh, set of uh, inverse problems on networks on graphs. Here, there, you see an example, for instance, of graph-based emotion classification algorithms from EEG records. We've also been looking at, they are in the top uh, right, uh, algorithms for online sequential change point detection from dynamic networks, namely observe a sequence of graphs, and you want to see when an anomaly happened or, or something occurred, for instance, in the context of wireless network monitoring. We're also pretty much uh, into machine learning as well, where we are working and developing, for instance, on, on graph neural networks. On the bottom left there, you can see an, a recent uh, exciting project we've been working uh, in the context of network neuroscience, where, where the goal is to uh, 
predicts short-term brain age from whole brain cortical uh, thickness features that one can extract from uh, MRI data, for instance. Um, and let me just conclude by, by saying that not all of our work uh, within signal processing has to do with networks per se. Just want to give an example uh, there in the bottom right so of some other recent uh, project I'm working with collaborators at the University of Leeds, where we have been developing a tensor-based uh, algorithms or decompositions from multi-aspect EMG data where, where the goal in this particular project is to try to reveal or unveil uh, aged-induced muscle couplings uh, in a very simple uh, object lifting task. So that's kind of a summary of some of the cool things we're doing. We have some COE-funded projects ongoing, also on inverse problems on, on, on graphs with uh, collaborators at uh, IBM Research as well. So very happy to chat more. Uh, you can find my contact information in the leaflet, and I'll be around for a while if you want to discuss any of these things further. So thanks for your attention. Hi, I'm John Belvian. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Zalient. Um, we do make wireless sensors for cows. Um, but specifically, we make um, electronic devices, IoT devices for agriculture in general, all wireless devices, which we um, design, um, manufacture, and market it uh, as, as well. We typically um, also set up networks uh, in, in the rural area to, to communicate uh, these devices. From, um, from a data standpoint and a collaboration standpoint, um, we use time series data, um, mainly from a, a device that is inserted um, at birth um, that is one of the things that is unique to what we do is as most monitoring devices are um, typical wearables. Um, we actually have ingestible devices um, that are um, now small enough to go in at birth. And we take um, multiple data streams and analyze them for specific performance, behavior, and animal welfare um, monitoring. Um, some of which is, you know, obviously from the performance standpoint of, of the farms, and then others that can, um, can complete the supply chain um, for the traditional protein uh, markets. One of the, some of the things that we are um, looking to improve in it with our, our data and analysis is, is we are getting into methane monitoring for greenhouse gases. Um, as well as some of the animal behavior um, pieces. We are currently collaborating um, now with a capstone project, the University of Rochester, on low temperature um, detections. Um, so obviously, if you think of health responses, there's, you know, temperatures can go up, um, but also the temperatures when they go down um, on the animal side can be more critical than the high. Um, we look forward to doing um, more collaboration in that standpoint. From a collaboration need for, for where we are, are heading is we, we collect um, a lot of data. We're looking to create some more compression algorithms um, to increase the amount of data that we actually need for detection, which in turn speeds up processing. Um, we, are, we are working on some in-sensor com computing to decrease the amount of data that that we send um, with wireless sensors inside um, animals. Obviously, battery life is critical, um, and power needs um, to get the signal outside uh, of the animal is also critical. So um, less data um, that we can send, the longer the lifespan of uh, the device is. And, and on that note, um, data compression. And then we are also looking into some internal um, energy generation on our devices. Um, so we're, we're trying to charge the, the battery um, using the motion um, of our uh, monitored animals. My information is, is in, the, in the pamphlet. I look forward to collaborating further. Glutonics is a photonics technology company that is focusing on next generation healthcare diagnostics. So what we do is we use light to measure biology. We take photonic integrated circuits that are fabricated right here in New York State at the 300 millimeter uh, foundry at SUNY Albany. We take these chips, getting up to 10,000 of them per wafer. We functionalize them with biological elements. We've done 
uh, various pieces of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We've done influenza virus. We've done cardiac biomarkers. Really, we can measure just about anything. We take these proteins. We, again, put them on one of the photonic chips that's fabbed at Albany. And then we integrate this with a passive microfluidic card. Using this system, we can create uh, point-of-care diagnostic devices that can be deployed at scale rapidly for a variety of targets, again, including pandemic agents such as viruses or cardiac biomarkers or, again, upper respiratory pathogens. So really what our goal is and what, what we're really looking for is business, business development ideas and potential investment to sort of bring this technology further along. So I've mentioned viruses and uh, cardiac biomarkers. There is essentially an unlimited amount of targets we could go for. Really, we need to find the market that we think will fit into best aside from cardiac, uh, cardiac panels, which is where we're currently moving. So what, what we wanna know really is we have the ability to produce these things at scale tens, hundreds of thousands of them relatively easily. The photonic manufacturing is essentially complete, complete passive microfluidics is just an injection mold process. So we can scale this pretty rapidly, but really we need to focus in on what we think is going to give us the biggest bang for our buck in terms of trying to achieve some sort of uh, FDA approved process and get that regulatory, um, regulatory compliance approved. So members of the team are Ben Miller, Michael Bryan, and myself. And uh, we're trying to improve triage at the point of care using photonic technologies. And with that, we've got a poster and a table at the session that comes this afternoon. So feel free to stop over and, uh, and chat with us if you think you have some ideas. I'll be the first to say good afternoon, even though we have, I guess, about 10 more minutes. <laughs> My name is Caitlin Dreisbach, and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Nursing and the Gorgon Institute for Data Science at the University of Rochester. I came to Rochester after a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the Data Science Institute at Columbia University. And it was there that I really gained an appreciation, a deep appreciation, for the application of data science tools into the clinical setting and for how we can leverage relationships with industry partners as a way to bring those ideas into reality. My goals in this pitch are to first urge you to consider how understanding the underlying biology is critical for building tools uh, ultimately deployed in the healthcare setting. And then second, to provide an introduction to some of my work at, and to see where that overlaps um, for future collaboration. So this slide here shows my overall research program of using data science methodologies to make better clinical assessments during pregnancy. This overarching goal is informed by my foundation of understanding the biological and genomic impacts of human health and disease. So here on the very far left, we want to understand the underlying biology as it impacts real functional and physiological changes that happen within our complex body systems. These functional changes then in the middle impact real symptoms that often drive patients to a provider, alert them to harm, or even you know, change their daily routines and well-being. Then the experiences that patients have with these symptoms are paramount. And where I think the real leverage on their very far, your right-hand side, is in patient-centered technology and innovation, where patients aren't just recipients of a technology, but are rather used as model inputs for a more refined, adaptive, and comprehensive clinical decision-making tool. So this map here does follow along with my personal professional trajectory from my pre-doc where I examined the role of the gastrointestinal microbiome in the development of impaired glucose tolerance during pregnancy, a precursor to the development of diabetes. And then in the middle section where I gained skills in symptom science, and then in the far right, again, where here at the University of Rochester, we have several project lines on ultrasound imaging analysis of prenatal ultrasounds, uh, using um, wearable sensor data to identify patterns within physiological changes, again, connecting those symptoms to the functional changes that happen within our bodies, and then building tools for predicting labor in the late components of pregnancy. Each of our projects aims to make better clinical assessments so that we can identify areas to intervene sooner and uh, optimize um, the health of our patients. 
My strong feeling is that individuals and families can be happier, healthier, and more empowered through the process of pregnancy and delivery. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you further. Ronald Hunt, COO, Green Tornado Wind and Water Turbines. Our inventor, Robert uh, Bishop, invented a few things you have heard of. The uh, ultrasound machine, the surge suppressor, 63 other industrial and manufacturing patents which have um, created over hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue and cost savings to major industry and mil military applications uh, throughout the world. So simple and utilitarian. Um, I'm going to give Robert Schultz minimalism. We have basically created a better power source for wind turbines. It is central. Uh, come to the booth later. I'll show you pictures in a video. <laughs> if you go to page 17 of the guide, there is a small description without contact information. I'll take care of that for you. But what we've done is we've reduced the number of parts. We've increased the number of, um, of wind application per square meter of blade. Uh, by reducing vibration, we create something called a vortex effect where we're geometrically, uh, geometrically and exponentially creating energy at 40 miles an hour and above where uh, conventional wind turbines have to shut down at 35 miles per hour because the blades become unstable. So just when we need the energy the most, we're producing no energy. And that's what happened in Texas about 18 months ago. Um, so this is a huge, huge uh, undertaking, of course. We uh, also, be the, cent the center of gravity, with no blades, we're not harming wildlife. We don't kill eagles, whales, dolphins, thousands of insects, um, and we, we're very proud of that. What are we looking to do? Uh, well, we're looking to take our data and, uh, and mine it. And the University of Rochester and the Center of Excellence is helping us do that. That's on our spring agenda. We're also getting university verification of all our independent uh, testing so far. We, are look we have one working prototype. Our mechanical engineer is working on several others. It can be scaled up to replace coal and natural gas power plants. It can be scaled down to produce electricity for cell towers where we don't have uh, communications in the Adirondacks, among other places in America. So there, the use, there are infinite numbers of uses and applications through the six prototypes that we are in the process of producing. What are we looking for? We're looking for money. <laughs> We're looking for expertise. We're looking for visionaries. So if anybody's got any of those, <laughs> Please see me at the booth. Thank you very much. Well, I guess I should be the last one to say good morning, right? That's right. good. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, um, so I say um, uh, Wayne Knox, University of Rochester from the Institute of Optics. Uh, I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning, and I realized that I should be giving one of these pitches here this morning. So I sent it to Mark, and uh, at 6.15, 6, Mark said, okay, you're in. So here we go. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so many of you in the audience have had a surgery sometime in your life. Some of those uh, may have had a bad outcome. And many of you in the audience uh, may have a surgery in the future, although you don't know it now. Uh, you don't want a, a bad outcome. So what am I talking about here? Well, it turns out that um, in common surgery uh, cases, like uh, carpal tunnel sy syndrome here, or cubital tunnel syndrome here, or uh, neck, head, um, those kind of uh, areas, or maybe down there, prostate areas, um, where, uh, where you want to have, uh, need to have some kind of surgery done, uh, then um, you don't want to have um, anybody accidentally cutting any nerves because the nerves are critical to its functioning in so many ways. So our collaborator, uh, Dr. David Mitten, uh, many of you know him in the orthopedics department at the U of R Medical Center, has told us that, um, <clears throat> that the largest lawsuit in the history of the University of Rochester Medical Center was from a nerve cut injury during a routine carpal tunnel uh, 
surgery, um, and it um, and it caused a, a bad a disability, and so that certainly gets people's attention. So um, the interesting thing here um, is that uh, during surgery, as shown in the upper left hand corner over here, there must be a little mouse here somewhere. Oh, is there a pointer? Something? There's the mouse. Get over here, mouse. Which is it on the right? Oh, we can use that. Okay, good. That's pretty cool. Does it actually work? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So, um, so during surgery, uh, the nerve, which is shown kind of shown here, is very difficult to find actually. And as the surgeons, uh, they don't have a lot of time. They have to get this done quickly. Um, and so, um, so the diff difficulty is, is how do you distinguish that nerve from uh, blood vessels um, and other things like uh, like cartilage, tendons? Uh, they t they kind of look the same in there. And besides the fact that they're kind of hidden under layers of, of fat, sometimes a muscle, different kinds of tissues. Um, and so the, the surgeon really wants something uh, like an early warning sign. Show me where that nerve is um, before I get to it. Like you're digging in the ground, you want to stop right before you hit the wire that's un buried underground. Um, and so, uh, so with my, um, um, actually, I was talking to my, my younger brother yesterday, um, who does medical device development, and he said, actually, um, I had a nerve, I had a knee replacement surgery, um, and they actually cut a nerve, and it's really bad because there's a whole section of my leg that I can't feel. Okay, so he, he was pretty jazzed about this when I told him yesterday. Um, so with my optics master's student, Howlin, who's out there in the audience, um, we've developed a, a prototype optical device and tested it um, in a chicken model. Um, How Lin has become a very proficient uh, chicken surgeon now. Uh, he's been trained how to go to Wegmans, buy chicken, and pull out the nerves. Um, he's done a great job on that. Um, for his master's thesis, by the way, this project has all been done in, in just one master's thesis, a uh, very short time. Um, and I think we'll have a record here uh, going to our first uh, live human clinical trial uh, shortly. Um, all of that in less than a year, which is quite amazing. Now, um, but before we got there, we had to show that it works in cadaver tissue. And so Howlin has worked um, in the, the amazing new orthopedic facility at the, at the mall there in Henrietta um, with some uh, human cadaver tissue here, where they looked here and, and, and exposed this, this uh, nerve. And with uh, Howlin's uh, magical processing and uh, and multispectral polarimetric imaging um, is able to pull that nerve right out. You see that there, and it's actually buried a few hundred microns below the surface there. And uh, so Paulin has a poster, and we hope you'll come to see that. Um, what are we looking for here? Well, um, we're looking for a commercial partner um, because we're, we're close to be, being able to take our, our little lab set up here and take it into a first uh, live human clinical trial. Um, and so we're interested in having a commercial partner to help us uh, develop a, a real clinical prototype. And, um, and actually, there are interesting things here. There is a commercially available vein imaging system. It's a little thing, you hold it over your arm like that, and it uses just simple near-infrared reflectance, two different wavelengths, oxy deoxyhemoglobin, um, and it actually projects with a green uh, laser pointer on there and shows where the nerve is, uh, sorry, where, where, the, where the blood vessels are. And if you search and search, you'll find nothing exists for nerves, okay? And we found this uh, a way to do it because the nerves are birefringent, and that's the, that's the key to it. Uh, we can use polarized light detection. So, um, so the interesting thing is we would actually like to probably develop even like an AR headset uh, that has this built into it so the surgeon can simply look and see where the nerve is, okay? Uh, we could also do a projection type. So we're looking for a, a commercial partner that'd like to help us assess the market on that and leverage some COE funding from this gentleman down here who has way more money than, no, anyway, he needs help spending money. Um, anyway, I would like to close by by saying that, uh, that I actually have a pretty decent uh, record here because I have a record uh, being the longest continuously funded CEIS, uh, University of Rochester researcher, uh, Mark, thank you, uh, 20 years, going on 20 years now, uh, continuously funded 
that was Clario Vision, as you heard Len talking about before. Uh, Clario Vision now has uh, $70 million in financing and employs over 100 people. And so uh, that's not a bad record. Uh, CES uh, could not have done it without you. And thank you for that. So please come see us at the poster. Happy to talk to you about that. Thank you. Hello, I'm James Monroe, the founder of Olvar. And we manufacture the only metals in the world that shrink when heated and expand when cooled. This is the opposite of almost all known materials. And this unique property opens the door for optics manufacturers to make smaller, lighter, lower cost, and faster lead systems. Um, so from small refractive optics for telecommunications that connect our world, to large space-based telescopes that peer into the deepest regions of our universe, all of our alloys naturally compensate for the expansion and contraction in these systems to keep these systems in focus. And one application that I'm very uh, passionate about is telescopes for ballistic missile defense. The bottom line is the US needs rapid sensor development because emerging threats could defeat our current sensor technology. The trouble is optics manufacturers are locked in to high cost and extremely long lead beryllium components as a key telescope material because there are no commercially available solutions that can survive the extreme environments of ballistic missile defense vehicles. That's why we created a brand new Alvar alloy. When combined with silicon carbide mirrors, it can be produced and manufactured 67% faster than beryllium. And the speed and the savings in time can enable optics manufacturers to develop new systems to defeat these emerging threats so that missile combat crews can protect millions around the globe. So my question is, what could you do with Alvar? Thank you. Well, thank you to all our speakers. Um, I just wanted to have everybody up for a photo, if that's possible, um, as far as speakers go. I know we're a little over and we're encroaching on your lunch, so thank you for your patience, and uh, hopefully get some networking opportunities out of this. <laughs>